I think the fundraising environment today is, is very tough. Uh, post Lehman back in 2008, I think you saw a lot of LPs pulling back their allocation um, to this asset class. But recently it seems like every day uh, you hear about another uh, sovereign wealth fund or another pension fund that's increasing their allocation uh, to, to, to this asset class. First, I want to introduce uh, Stephen Adler. Um, Stephen Adler is editor-in-chief of Reuters News, where he directs the editorial operations and news strategy for the largest news organization in the world. Uh, Reuters has nearly 3,000 journalists in 200 bureaus across the globe. Reuters News reaches over 1 billion people every day. Go Reuters. Um, previously, Stephen was uh, editor-in-chief of Business Week. During his tenure there, the magazine won more than 100 major journalism awards. Prior to Business Week, Stephen spent 16 years at the Wall Street Journal, uh, leading a team that won three Pulitzer Prizes. Please help me welcome Stephen Adler. Um, so next, um, we have, uh, I mean, really to use the cliche, a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him an introduction anyway. Um, Henry Kravis co-founded KKR in 1976, and today is KKR's co-chairman and co-CEO. He currently serves on the boards of First Data Corp and China International Capital Corporation Limited. Um, the brief bio, which you'll read about Henry in our delegate book, um, is uh, it disguises what can only be described as a legendary investing career. Uh, Mr. Kravis co-founded and leads one of the oldest, most successful, and most innovative um, private equity firms or um, investing um, firms of any kind in the world. Um, he's one of the best known investors of his generation. He's an active philanthropist. Um, he recently pledged $100 million um, for the growth of the Columbia Business School. He serves as a trustee and director on countless cultural, educational, and phil philanthropic institutions. And as I said, he really needs no more introduction from me. Please help me welcome Henry Kravis. Good to see you. Well, welcome, Henry, and we're, we're all very excited to have you here and uh, hear what you have to say. So, uh, and it's good to see everybody here, and Thomson Reuters is d delighted to be uh, having this opportunity. Uh, I was reading your 10K the other day for, you know, sort of pleasure reading, and something, <laughs> something you couldn't, couldn't have done a couple of years ago, and especially struck by uh, your launch date, just reminding myself you started in 1976. And that's really the span of the industry. I mean, you were really a pioneer in the industry. And I'm wondering if you could launch a bit by talking about the changes you've seen in the industry over those years, and also how KKR has adapted to those changes before we get kind of more specific about what's going on now. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Stephen. It's, uh, one, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for uh, having me. I appreciate it. Um, actually, uh, George Roberts and Jerry Kohlberg and I started back in the late 1960s, uh, first through Bear Stearns, and then uh, and then uh, started KKR in 76. Those days we called them bootstrap acquisitions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I think the one thing that has been constant throughout uh, our 36 years at KKR and even before uh, is one word that I would use, alignment. Uh, and that is an alignment of, of interest between GP, between management, and between the limited partners. Uh, we all have a, a common objective. We're all owners. Uh, we've all put up our own money in it, and then there is a real alignment to, to reach a long-term goal, uh, which is to make the company a better company, and, and hopefully in return uh, to that, you'll also uh, have a, a very decent return. So uh, if you go back in the, in the 70s and, and in the 80s, uh, that was a pretty nice time. Um, None of you, I don't think, were really in business uh, in private equity at that time. And uh, so that, was, that wasn't so bad. Uh, now there are, somebody gave me a number the other day that there's some 14,000 companies in America today, or around the world, globally, um, that are, that are uh, backed by, by private equity. It's sort of an incredible number. And you think quickly, what has changed? Well. Number one, back in 1976 when we started KKR, hard to believe, we literally could not raise a $25 million fund. We went out to, to, to do that. We got halfway there and 
probably could have raised the rest on uh, in terms uh, that weren't particularly attractive to us. And so we really couldn't even get started with that. There were probably three or four banks in the U.S. that uh, provided some senior loans. And then you had the insurance companies. Uh, you had the Prudential Insurance Company, which is the largest of them. And you had Mass Mutual, Connecticut General, Connecticut Mutual, and one or two others that provided capital. And you'd go to them, and you basically would uh, go up and down uh, the capital structure with them. They'd take some senior debt, some subordinated debt, uh, maybe a slice of preferred stock, and, uh, and then finally they'd take some equity. And then we'd provide some equity uh, as individuals. And so what happened is there, there really is a one major change that happened in 1984, and that was uh, started through Drexel Burnham with the uh, the advent of the uh, high yield market right. made a big difference because all of a sudden you could go to them and they would in a very short period of time call up their their clients which were primarily uh, companies like Executive Life and a number of the savings and loans uh, that they did and you'd have a deal done pretty quickly on the uh, the high yield piece Banks, you still dealt with the banks, and they were the same banks, and a few others started coming in. And, uh, and then funds uh, really got started. But throughout this, that alignment stayed, uh, stayed absolutely intact. Today, uh, we're in a business where I don't know a country, literally a country, that there's not some private equity uh, activity in that country, and that there's not a financial institution uh, in that uh, country that's participating in what we'll call private equity. So uh, much more competition today, many more companies that, are, that understand what private equity is, many more companies that are prepared to sell their business or get capital to have growth capital. I know Josh Lerner's comment in the, uh, the panel before was, uh, was very telling in which he thought that the emerging markets uh, we're going to be a big uh, push into the future and 10 years from now that would be a big part of it. I think he's probably right uh, and that really comes as growth capital. So today what has morphed from buying a company, buying a private company, you can buy public companies, take them private, you can buy subsidiaries of public companies, you can provide growth capital, private equity invest up and down the capital structure today, all of which is different than what you had before. You've also diversified in KKR beyond what you would traditionally call private equity, which I think would be interesting to this group to understand why you've done that. You're, you're doing a couple of things. You're investing in public markets. Um, you have a fee-based management, essentially consulting business that uh, I think is becoming a larger part of the business. Uh, you're investing in assets, not just companies. Uh, talk about the evolution and why you're kind of going beyond the traditional um, you know, buy a company uh, approach. Well, I give you the, 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 the reason in, 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 in a simple format. We, we come up with a lot of ideas, um, and it used to be you'd go in and you'd see a, a CEO, and you'd ask her or you'd ask him, is your, is your company for sale? And if they said, no, we have no interest in selling, that was sort of the end of the right. conversation. And yet you say, that's a great company. I'd like to figure out some way to participate in that uh, in that company, but there really wasn't a way. So I think there's one transaction that really finally convinced us that we should go ahead and figure out how to invest up and down the capital structure, provide equity, become a minority partner, and, and, and go on the board and really work with the management team to make that company a better company, to be able to provide debt capital if that's what was needed, or to buy the company 100% uh, or some something less than that. We, we were looking at a company called Williams Companies out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Very good uh, pipeline company. They ran into difficulty. They needed capital. And um, uh, we knew them. I'm from Tulsa. They're headquartered in Tulsa. And um, we built a nice relationship with them. We said, well, look, all we can do to help you is buy the company. We, we really can't just provide capital. They said, look, we want to stay public. What we need is some long-term subordinated debt with it, with some, and an equity kicker that comes in with it. Uh, that's what we need today to solve our problem. We couldn't do it. We didn't have that capital or that capability. Along came Warren Buffett, 
and made a terrific investment. Uh, same structure, same everything that we had set up. It, don't blame him. He, he was set up. He could take advantage of it. And that convinced us that, you know, we've got to be able to take advantage. We're creating a lot of ideas, a lot of opportunities, but we have to take advantage of them. So that was the first step, and that was really started in 2004. And we said, let's do whatever we're going to build at, at KKR. Let's build it so everything connects. You have to understand about KKR. KKR today, and it was exactly the same way when we started the firm in 1976, operate as one firm. Everyone at KKR participates in absolutely everything we do. They participate in the carried interest. They participate in stock ownership. They participate in the fees, whether they worked on the transaction, they didn't work on it, whether they're located in Beijing or they're located in London or they're located in Menlo Park or New York, wherever, it doesn't matter. Now, the reason for that is a very simple reason. We did not ever want to have a firm that was an eat what you kill culture. Culture is critical to us and we, we live by it, we talk about it at every firm meeting that we have and it's one of inclusion where everybody works together. So coming with that as background, we said what we really have to do is set up an organization so that private equity will be core and will remain core to what we do but from that there are lots of other things that will come off of it. Well, our debt business was the first thing we did. It was a, it was a credit business, uh, non-investment grade. You know, hopefully we understood credit well enough having spent enough money buying uh, companies and leveraging them. And so from that, then we said, what other things can we do? So if you take a snapshot of what KKR is, KKR in 04 was one business. It was private equity in Europe and in the US. That was it. Today, fast forward, we're in three buckets, private markets, public markets, and capital markets. On the private market side, we're in private equity, we're in oil and gas, uh, we're in infrastructure, uh, and we're in real estate. On the public markets uh, side, we're in the liquid credits business that we started in 04, have expanded that so that now we can invest or uh, provide capital from senior debt all the way through mezzanine, high yield, uh, and special situations, and then we have a, um, a long short uh, equity business as well. And then we have a capital markets business that gives us a big advantage because what that does, it enables us to finance our own companies much more uh, intelligently. We actually own it as opposed to being a renter of Wall Street. Wall Street's great. We work very closely with Wall Street, very important uh, part of what we do. But on the other hand, if you're an owner, you're going to worry about every quarter and, and, and each structural change that you're going to make in a loan agreement. Whereas if we just go to the street and say, just raise this money for us, they're going to do the best they can, but they don't really care whether it's the last quarter or last, uh, you know, three eighths, uh, whereas we do and our people do. So that's the third piece of what we have. And that's the reason, because we wanted to be able to be a solutions provider across the board for companies. And we've been able to do that. I've been particularly interested in your move into energy because you're buying energy assets, you're not just buying energy companies. Mm -hmm. right. And in fact, you just bought some shale uh, natural gas uh, fields right. in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was announced yesterday. Yes. Um, talk about, everybody's interested in opportunities. Why do you see such a big opportunity um, in energy and in, in natural gas in particular? Look, I, I'm ha happy that you asked that. Um, energy is an important part of what, where our focus is today at KKR. Um, both George Roberts and I, our fathers were in the oil and gas business. George comes from Houston. I come from Tulsa. So we sort of grew up in the, in the business and um, it's something we've always liked. We made our first investment in oil and gas in, in buying a half interest in a uh, company uh, called Union Texas Petroleum from Allied Signal. At the time, it happened to be uh, the largest independent oil and gas operator. That was in 1984 we bought that company. Um, held it for about 17 years, uh, liked it. Uh, quite frankly, when we made the investment, we went out of the gate backwards. We, oil prices were at about $14 a barrel. They, we said, oh, they'll never go down below eight. Well, they went through eight so fast and, you know, so, and then it sort of get up, get back. So anyway, 17 years we held it, made, made a, a decent return on it finally. 
didn't do much in it uh, until 2007. And we've been watching it, paying attention to it for a long time, and particularly in shale. And we saw that this was the next uh, big uh, idea that uh, we thought was coming. And what the operators in shale gas needed, uh, they needed capital. But in 07, 08 period, as you'll remember, you had a, uh, you had a period when uh, there was no capital available. We were in financial crisis uh, at that time. But we found extremely good operators, first in the uh, Marcellus field in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, and then uh, a, a year later uh, down in Eagleford, down in, down in Texas. They needed capital, we needed an operator. And so uh, we knew we were finding the best operators in those fields, and we knew they had very good uh, locations uh, in which to drill. If you don't drill on a, on a lease uh, for shale, uh, within a short period of time, you lose that lease. And so they needed the capital to make sure they could maintain their leases. We came along, provided that capital. We got in and we got out very quickly. In one case, we made eight times our money in, in the Marcellus, and the other we made uh, about a uh, uh, little under uh, four times our money. Now, or three times our money we made. And so in that, in both of those cases, um, we, we got lucky in part, but we had, a, we had a concept. Expand that now, and that same concept is still very much viable today. Drillers need capital, can't get capital as easily as they could. Uh, we're pricing them differently today with 220 uh, uh, BTU gas. You have to price it differently than if, if gas is at $6. Uh, dollars. And so, and your forward curve has come down uh, dramatically. So without getting into a lot of detail, we think it's a very good hedge against inflation. Uh, you look at supply and demand uh, on the liquid side on a global basis. We think uh, oil prices will stay high for a long time just because of the global supply and demand. And we're also um, looking at it from the gas side, particularly now with these low gas prices. So uh, we're doing everything from buying non-core uh, assets from the major oil companies uh, and we have a 50-person operating team out of Tulsa that we have partnered with. These are engineers and operating people. And it's like any non-core subsidiary of a public company. They, the the, the uh, properties have not gotten the engineers. They haven't uh, received any capital from the parent company. And in some cases, they haven't even fixed a bridge to get across, so they can get equipment across to fix wells that aren't pumping. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things that we'll do, and uh, we find them very attractive. In addition to that, we've got a joint venture uh, uh, with, a, with a major operator around uh, uh, for, uh, for assets outside of North America. We just made our first investment in Ecuador, uh, mm -hmm. where they're going to operate uh, the field. We're putting capital up, and, they're, and we're their partner. So we just find a lot of opportunities. There's a need for capital. There's a need to operate these properties more efficiently. They're proved developed properties in the most case. Uh, and so that's why we like them. I know you watch environmental issues closely in your investments. You're pretty confident that the, the fracking issues are not going to become major environmental problems for natural gas. We, we, we don't think so. Uh -huh. Look, um, right now, there, the studies that have been done um, have uh, pointed that this is not a major concern. It's more of a political concern than, than I think it is a major environmental concern. First of all, um, this drilling is way under the water table, number one. They're encased twice uh, by cement, and they're encased by, uh, by pipe uh, in addition to that. Um, and so other than if they're bad operators, yes, this, the, you could have some isolated instances, mm -hmm. no question about it, uh, that this has happened and could happen. But the technology that you have today, in general, this should not be a mm -hmm. problem. Okay. So, so looking at other places where you see opportunity, I think everybody's been talking today about where is their opportunity. Um, you are mostly, as you say, in the U.S. and Europe. You still have a very large Europe fund. Uh, you now have an Asia fund. Uh, talk to us a bit about Asia. How should we be thinking about Asia? Where are the opportunities? Where are the pitfalls? Well, Asia is very much of a local business. Um, we have, uh, for the size fund that we have in, in Asia, we have a $4 billion current fund. We're in the market right now raising a, a larger fund. 
uh, we have uh, probably much many more people per size of fund than you do in Europe or you have in the States. And the reason is very simple. One, distances are very, very far apart. Secondly, you have to have Chinese for China. You have to have Japanese for Japan. You want the Aussies down in Australia, et cetera. And uh, so that's why it becomes a very local business. Um, where, where we're focusing our efforts in Asia is very much based on uh, the consumer. Uh, the consumer is um, in Asia is moving up the, uh, the socioeconomic uh, ladder. Uh, in China in particular, more and more people are moving from the rural areas to the city, and now it's almost 50-50. And they want what we have. They want what the West, mm -hmm. what the West has. <clears throat> and so we've been focusing primarily on growth capital. We have not bought anything in China. Doubt we'll ever buy anything in China. But you don't have to because there are a lot of companies in, in China that want our expertise. We come at everything from, a, a one, a best practices a standpoint, and two, an industrialist approach. How can we improve the operations of any company uh, where we're making an investment? And one of the things I always like to ask people, whether it's in India, China, wherever it is, particularly if we're going to be a minority uh, investor and help them but work side by side, one, do you really want us? If, if all you want is our capital, we're probably the wrong people because our capital <clears throat> is probably more expensive than what you could, might be able to get elsewhere. Secondly, are you in this for the long term? Do you really want to do something in the long term? And we at KKR, uh, other than a, a few isolated uh, places where we've gotten lucky in energy, uh, it has primarily been um, uh, hold much longer than the average private equity firm. And we've done that by design uh, because we just think we can continue to work the companies better. So in, if you're taking a minority position and you're becoming partners uh, with somebody in China or in India in particular or anywhere else, Vietnam, we just did a deal last year. It really is based on uh, who is the partner, what are their objectives, and do they really want us to be by their side to help them become a better, a better company. So in this consumer space, for example, because we think that's a, a big theme out there, that's an area that we're focusing on. And they're all the way from from uh, uh, buying into a company that needed capital in outside of uh, Shanghai in the auto dealerships. Now, we probably wouldn't think about auto dealerships in the, in the West, but there, everybody wants a car. And we have 28 auto dealerships right now. It's growing like a weed. They can't keep the cars on the lots, even though they're priced almost double what you pay here because of tariffs. We made investment in the largest liquor store chain uh, in, um, uh, in China called VATS. Uh, it's last year grew at about 70% in sales uh, over the year before and it's just growing month over month like that. Again, it's something that people want uh, and uh, they're prepared to spend whatever. So it's the consumer we're focused on. We see a lot of opportunities. The one thing I will caution you about as you're thinking about Asia, spend most of your time as we would do anywhere, whether it's Europe, Asia, or, or, or US, uh, who's your partner? How much uh, uh, confidence do you have in them? How much have you really checked them out? And so we spend an enormous amount of time making sure that we probably, I'd say, probably spend 60% of the time looking at who is the partner mm -hmm. and the balance, what is the company? The company's easy to figure out. If yeah. you can have the best company, if you have the wrong partner and they're in control, you'll lose money. Yeah. Is, is there, are there any other countries in Asia that you're particularly interested in that might be less obvious? I mean, are you interested in Vietnam? Are you doing work in, in places that are a little bit um, kind of less central to the story? A absolutely. Uh -huh. we, made, we made a terrific investment last year in Vietnam. <clears throat> it was a company called Masan. Masan is the uh, largest food company in, in Vietnam. It's got uh, fish sauce, it has uh, uh, noodles. It's a terrific business. They needed capital. They didn't want to go public, and so we became their partner in that. Uh, Korea has been a terrific market uh, for us. We have several investments in Korea, the largest of which uh, is Oriental Brewing. Uh, that's a, um, a uh, uh, the, there are only two uh, beer companies in uh, Korea by, by, uh, by law and by regulation. Uh, I think both of us can make pretty good money doing that. And so 
<clears throat> that's a good mark. In fact, about 20%, I think, of all private equity in Asia since 2004 has actually gone into Korea. So Korea is a wonderful market. We made a number of investments in Singapore and in, and in Malaysia. Very good components manufacturers, uh, technology businesses mm -hmm. out there that have worked uh, very well. We've even bought a company in, in Japan, and I've been going to Japan uh, at least once a year since 1978, and uh, I wasn't sure we'd ever make an investment there, but I told my partners when we decided to go to Asia, if we're going to, to go to Japan, we have to be patient. You've got to look at this thing. This may take us 10 years before we do anything, but let's have that patience. Let's plant a flag. Let's get there and build, build a reputation. And we did. We made a terrific investment, a uh, company called Intelligence, which is in the <clears throat> outplacement and uh, executive search business, and it's humming along. They're the hardest thing we found uh, in looking at other things. Can you find a management team that is pre prepared to make change? And that's probably the hardest thing. We happen to have found one, and he's been absolutely terrific as a CEO and great, great partner for us. Yeah. Before we leave the sort of geographical tour, uh, Europe. There's a lot of disagreement among investors about Europe. Uh, some people feel like prices are so low that you can really start making money there. Some people say, boy, the Eurozone just isn't going to make it. Where, where are you on that? Uh, look, the Eurozone is going to make it in the long term. You have to be patient. You have to be selective of what you, where you're going to invest. Um, to make a broad uh, categorical statement and say private equity doesn't work in Europe, you know, I'm not sure I would buy it. We have always done the best at KKR uh, when there's been absolute volatility or when people um, are looking at their navel and basically saying, oh, woe me, you know, the world's coming to an end. Uh, that's the best time to go make investments. You know, you've got to dig and you have to, again, use all of, the, of, of your tools that you have. And one of the things that we focus very much on, besides who is the management, who's the partner, is coming at it with this industrialist approach. So we start with a 100-day plan. And we, the first thing we'll put in are metrics. You'd be surprised, Stephen, how few companies actually have good metrics. They all say they have metrics, yeah. but in reality, what they really have are financial statements. And that's a rear view look. Mm -hmm. Metrics focus on what's happening at a, you know, in a production process or in a sales process today and looking forward. So you can buy some terrific companies in markets. You say, gee, I don't know how I'd ever put any money in that market because it's a bad market, because you found a good company mm -hmm. that you can fix, that you yeah. can improve the operations on. And if you don't think that's it, and you're just going to basically play the market, then I think you're gambling more than, than you should. OK, um, we're actually already starting to run low on time, which is amazing. But uh, I have a few other things I want to make sure we sure. get to. Uh, the question of, go of, a, uh, of going public came up in the previous discussion. So I wanted to put that question to you. Are there risks to limited partners and uh, to investors in a, in a company like yours uh, going public? What are the advantages of, of being public? And how, how have you experienced the change? I, I know you're 70 percent, uh, still 70 percent uh, owned by your staff, by employee owned, mm -hmm. and 30 percent publicly held. But uh, talk a bit about that. Sure. Um, look, being public gave us a real advantage. Um, number one, the way we did it was different than, uh, than others. Um, Jane, in the panel before, I thought raised a very good point. Um, if, if it's just to go public to, so that the uh, uh, partners can all take the money out and put a lot of money in their pocket, the question is, do you still have alignment of interest? In, in our case, what we did was we actually merged KKR partnership into something called uh, KKR Private Equity Investors, which had a, uh, was the largest limited partner in, uh, in our own companies. So we knew the businesses that we were getting into. We merged the two together and became a, a through a backdoor merger, and became public that way. KKR, George and I have not taken a penny out of, out of KKR. That's not what our interest is. Reason we went public, we wanted to have a balance sheet. So by doing it this way, uh, we've ended up with about a $6 billion balance sheet that we can use to continue to invest in our own companies, which we're investing in, and to invest in new products and, and new businesses that we're creating at KKR. So if you look at what has KKR done, today, as a limited, as, as a general partner, uh, we have over $6.5 billion invested in our own companies. 
Now, if that's not an alignment of interest with a limited partner, I don't know what is. There's no firm that has that kind of, of uh, uh, money invested side by side. And that's not just our balance sheet. That's also uh, individuals at KKR uh, that invest right alongside as well. So there's real skin in the game. It's long-term investing and long-term money. We will not start any business unless we're going to put our own capital in. It doesn't matter if it's private equity, our debt business, whatever it is. And that's a very important thing. If I were giving us money, I'd want to know, are you putting real money up? And so by going public, it gave us that. Secondly, we are not taking a position that we're going to worry about next quarter's earnings. Now, I tell anybody, if you're worried about what we're going to earn next quarter, I couldn't tell you what we're going to earn next quarter. There's so many variables uh, to it. We're not making widgets. Uh, what, what we're doing depends on uh, mark to market with our portfolio of private equity investments. It depends on what transactions get completed during a particular year, what our capital markets uh, group does in a particular quarter or during year. So if you're going to invest with a firm in private equity, you have to take the long, long approach. What are the reasons we did it? We did it, one, to have that capital base, which gives us a real advantage. Number two, we wanted to have a stock to be able to retain um, our, our people and we've been able to retain people. But not only that, we've been able to track some of the best people during this downturn. We've doubled the size of KKR uh, in the last four years. And it's been because we just saw opportunities where uh, Wall Street was getting out of certain businesses. Uh, they, were, they were either letting people go or people weren't happy where they were. And we got some of the best people. Uh, e example of that, uh, we got Craig Farr, who was uh, head of equity capital markets for the U.S. at City, came over, runs our capital markets business. Uh, Sanjay Nayar in India ran India for, for City uh, and so forth. And so we've been able to attract terrific people during this period of time. Having stock to use to attract it is good. And the third piece, is really to be able to use uh, to possibly make some acquisitions, which we may do uh, at some point, to continue to build out our business and, uh, and grow KKR in a sensible way. Um, let me also ask you, uh, b before we run out of time, about the regulatory environment. You've, by necessity, had to pay attention to it. You've been down to Washington. Uh, where do you see Washington on uh, the carried interest question, the tax question? What do you think is going to happen? And if something happens, when do you think it's going to happen, given the fact that we're in the middle of a presidential campaign? Look, I, I think there's a broader uh, answer to that than whether what exactly happens to carried interest. I, I don't know what's going to happen to carried interest. But um, what I would say is right now we have a tax uh, system in the U.S. that basically uh, is not the most competitive in the world and is not necessarily uh, conducive to creating jobs uh, and, and, uh, and creating investment. So where I start from, I think you have to look at our whole tax system. And so that means you have to look at everything uh, across all, uh, all segments there. Carried interest could be part of that, uh, uh, clearly but there are lots of other things that would need to be looked at at all, and come up with a, a tax system, and I hope uh, that our uh, politicians in Washington will focus on a tax system, uh, whether it's now or whether it's in a year or two years from now, that is going to be conducive and really encourage investment and creation of jobs. That's the only way we're going to get this economy going. Now, one can argue that it's one of many things that has slowed the economy is our tax system, and I think that's, that's a fair statement. So I think looking across the board, it will be something that uh, everyone will, will look at. Carried interest will clearly be looked at. It's already been looked at. It will be looked at again as part of an overall uh, solution. Uh, do you worry that if Romney is the nominee, it's going to be bad for the industry because there'll be so much negative focus? You know, the one thing I've, I've tried to do at KKR and encourage everybody else at KKR is don't, don't focus on, on politics. Let's focus on what we're good at. And uh, we think we're pretty good at making investments. We think we're uh, as creative as, as we could be. And, and now the question is, let's do the best for our limited partners. Let's do the people that are investing with us and happen to own stock in addition, limited partners. And how do we, how do we make sure that we're getting the best returns back. And that, to me, what we need, whether it's uh, President Obama, who you know, was uh, handed a, 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 a tough situation in the middle of a downturn, and 
you know, he's doing what he can to get it turned around, or whether it's uh, Romney, who's uh, the nominee and, and, and is elected president, whatever they do, they have to focus very much on how are we going to create jobs, how are we going to make the U.S. Uh, more competitive. And to me, that's where we really have to, have to focus. Final question. Does your philanthropy have anything to do with your business, or is that something you just do because you've made a lot of money and you want to give back, or is there a connection between what you do in the philanthropic world and what you do in the business world? Look, the only, look, I, for years I've been giving either my time or giving money. I love it. And, and those of you that have been uh, fortunate enough to have the time or have, have some money to be able to, uh, to give to uh, those less fortunate, let me tell you, from my standpoint, uh, it is one of the most rewarding things that I've done. I, yes, we could buy another company and all that's nice. But, but being able to look at the smile on people or have a young uh, person come up and said, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Kravis, you, you made a huge difference in my life. You got me off drugs because of your program that you created. I can't tell you, money can't buy that. And so the only area where uh, the business has come in, I started something uh, back about 15 years ago or so called the New York City Investment Fund to be able to create jobs and create businesses in the inner city in New York. And I based it uh, a little bit on our model at KKR, the industrialist approach uh, is uh, divided up by industry specialization where we have uh, a very big network of all the major companies in New York and they have people and they'll work uh, to help uh, 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 fledgling companies in the inner city. And so that's the only area. Giving back is something that comes from your heart to me. It's, it's not I do it because it's the right thing. I do it because I want to do it. Um, if we have time, can we do, can we do a couple of questions? Uh, a couple sure. of questions from the audience? I, I can't see too well, but go, go ahead. There's lights. Go ahead. I, I, hard to hear. Is there a microphone? David, uh, let's get a mic, Yes, David. here it comes. Hi, it's David Toll, editor of Bios Magazine. Henry, you mentioned the possibility of doing some acquisitions. I wonder if you could expand on what kind of businesses you might buy and also address whether you might be interested in buying other private equity firms to take you into new strategies that you're not in now. Now, you don't expect me to answer that, do you? <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> Look, um, businesses that we might buy at KKR, and I'm not saying we will, uh, but that we might look at that, that would make some sense, our, our expansions are where we are today, you know, where we can add on to areas where we might be able to grow them faster or get a terrific team to come on board. A good example of that, um, we uh, started our long short uh, equity business. Uh, we brought over the, uh, the team that did proprietary trading at Goldman Sachs. And uh, they, came, they came over in mass. And fortunately, we didn't have to buy it, but, but it would have been something like that if they'd had assets and they were coming with assets that might make sense for us as an expansion of what we were doing, but, an, but a logical extension of, of where, we, where we are. Uh, for one private equity firm to buy another private equity firm, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of overlap of, of limited partners. Uh, I don't know whether the limited partner says, oh, I'm going to double up because you've now put the two firms together. I'm, I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of that. Uh, certainly, it's not an area we're looking at. Okay, uh, maybe one more question. Um, okay, can't see with the lights, but uh, if a mic comes over there, we can get the question. There we go. Uh, hi, Greg Romilios from uh, Reuters. Uh, you described some areas where KKR has diversified um, beyond buyouts. As the traditional investment banks um, retrench a little bit with regards to their uh, traditional experience uh, activities and proprietary trading, do you see your firm and other private equity firms stepping in in that aspect? Um, what we're not going to do at KKR is we're not in the investment banking business. We're not, you know, advisory business. We're not doing mergers and acquisitions, which is a big part of what <coughs> Wall Street uh, does. <coughs> Where we have uh, stepped in uh, is with our capital markets business. As an example, 
capital markets, uh, a lot of the banks and a lot of the big investment banks that are still left uh, are not focused on the smaller and mid-market uh, companies like they were. They just can't afford it today to cover them. And as a result of that, that has left a vacuum. And so in our case, that's an area that we, we got into. Another area that we've gotten into is direct lending. Uh, so we've raised money wholesale in fund, in a fund, in a, in a, a bank fund, a debt fund, that will lend to middle market uh, companies where they can't get uh, loans today because the banks aren't covering them. So those are some of the areas that we at uh, KKR are focused on. And I think, yes, you'll see more and more of that. You'll see, you see Blackstone has a, has a very good, capable uh, business in real estate. Well, that's an area that Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs were, were very much in and others. They built a terrific business there. They have GSO, which is their debt business. Uh, we have our debt business. And so, uh, yes, those are filling some gaps and playing a role which uh, have been vacated by the, uh, by the banks. We could talk for another hour. Unfortunately, the time is up. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been Good. a real pleasure. Thanks Thank very you so much. much. Thank you, Steve.